Welcome, welcome all. Here we are. Talk about another multi character actor that is Ernie Hudson. Welcome back, John. Always glad to be here. Right, yes. So, Ernie Hudson, let's get to it. Home you know is Winston in the Ghostbusters films. You know him. It's also as Detective Albright in The Crow. You know him also from. Being one of the heroes in Congo, great ape escape killing, and then as the warden on HBO's Oz, probably his best role in my opinion. So, yeah, he's just one hell of an actor, and anytime I see him just show up, he's just I know again like all the Michael Ironsides and Tony Todd's of the world, it's gonna make you remember he was in that. <laughs> oh, definitely. Once again. He's got way too damn much to list, so we'll just go with the best of what we got. What other stuff do you remember him from? <laughs> well, besides all the ones we mentioned, and I gotta mention his role in the I call the underrated creature from Leviathan. Yes, the, he's in the Leviathan Terror at Sea movie and has just about every kind of guest spot you can think of. Different strokes, mm -hmm. Little House on the Prairie, Taxi, Dukes of Hazard. One movie I think I saw him first outside of outside of Ghostbusters was Space Hunter in the Adventure Zone, Forbidden Zone, and that was not good, but it was interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to like it, I do, but it's it's a turd. It's a really unorganized movie, and he has fun being in it. He has brief roles in a bunch of other just comedies like Going Berserk, as well as the real life. Larry Cohen scripted TV drama Wound of San Quentin and then does plenty of other guest spots like the A-Team. It's briefly on St. Elsewhere as a firefighter trying to get the passion to heal. He's in the Adam West sitcom The Last Precinct and guest stars and other stuff like the new Mike Hammer and Full House. So, so wild though how for the longest time he did various voiceovers on Pound Puppies. <laughs> One of the dirty yeah. dozen TV movies. So, keep forgetting other stuff he's in but you know he's always the best part of anything because he will never play the same exact role he knows how to he has the charisma down to a t he is just his middle word name should be c as in charisma because he's he just fits in anything that he's a part of so then he's briefly on the stephen j cannell produced broken badges with miguel ferrar you can get that on dvd or on youtube and he plays the mute uh, caretaker on the hand that rocks the cradle, the garden guy. <laughs> <laughs> Always takes you a minute to realize, God, that was such a realistic just how he was able to communicate with the just using his eyes and his hands. <laughs> <laughs> and more guest spots. You might remember him as the tennis captain on the Ben Stiller show, plenty of other TV movies and miniseries. I don't think I've seen his Tales from the Crypt episode, but I'll have to check I it out. That one. <laughs> was that a good one? Oh, that was actually a solid one, particularly his performance, which was Did he play? very, well, it was very atypical of him, especially during that time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's been 94. Big ass year. He is taken off. You know, Sugar Hill gets to wider release. He has a brief gangster supporting role in that. And it was interesting for here because you kind of assume that he sold out the gangsters. But he kind of had it for the brief time on screen, you get a sense that he's looking over his shoulder like, you know, someone's going to snipe him at any time. And I was like, that was interesting because anyone else would have probably just, you know, said their lines on time and walked off and he <laughs> gave it a backstory without even having to. It works. Um, but yeah, so Singer did The Crow. He was in No Escape. You know, just a fun apocalyptic movie. And then the yeah, Cowboy the Way. That he, oh, I was going to say. Oh, totally. No okay. that, I was going to say with No Escape that he, that's a character that, while it's a small role, he manages to bring that to life, even something he, small as that. He has the, all like the best talking parts where he's just oh, yeah. like, are you sure you want to do this? You know, we're outnumbered. We got all these guys terrorizing a village <laughs> it's just we also have 
ones like Airheads he shows up in. Yes, he does. Yeah, which was fun to see. And once again, making fun of the. So again, yeah, he did that back to back with the cowboy way, and this is like he got he had a shtick for just playing just the cop. I think at that point, just he's in the same year he's doing the crow. He's like, yeah, need a cop, choose Ernie Hudson. <laughs> which I have no problem with whatsoever. Yeah, he's a really convincing cop. It makes you wonder if he knew someone in his family who was a cop or something or knew friends. I don't know, because the only thing we can find on his, just his various biopics is just talking about how when he wasn't getting any acting roles, he basically just started working with theater groups and writing his own material to perform on stage. I just find that just so awesome how he was just, he activated his own career. Eventually, some producer saw him and said, I got to cast that guy. <laughs> well, thank God that happened. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so, and then 95, Basketball Diaries. I don't remember who he played because I'm not crazy about that movie. But uh, I, you know, then Congo. I also did forget about Speechless. He kind of has a few amusing lines in that political comedy, Gina Davis and. Mm -hmm. Michael Keaton, but let's talk about the substitute. <laughs> this is a great oh, God, over the yeah. top movie. <laughs> I love particularly his performance. That mm -hmm. it's like I said, just like the Tales of the Crypt episode, that it's you know, a typical performance of Anya Hudson, and that's why I love it because it showed that he does have range outside of him just playing a normal guy, exactly. And plus. You get to see him and Tom Berenger fight, which A plus for me. Come on now. Yes, Berenger is the man. <laughs> Say what you will about his career. That dude never phones in a performance. Um and more or less, um so yeah, from that point on, I just wasn't ever surprised at what kind of roles he was in from that point on. He just any chance he got, he would sneak in like a guest spot or a voice acting gig in between seasons of Oz. So it was always cool can't lost track of how many times he would play a gangster or dad or a politician and so and steadily working also in just tv movies of the week also and and then let's let's go with the watchers just back to copville he's the swat commander in that yeah leading the manhunt and then thanks james spader's in over his head um uh, how about miss congeniality movies <laughs> Well, that's also a very interesting role in him. Because... Right, he's pretty much he's spoofing cop roles. And then that's yeah, it. that's pretty much what he's doing. But I mean, he's utilized better than the first movie in the sequel, I'd say. Oh, yeah. The sequel, he's not getting much to do at all. Right, just show up. Hey, I'd take it too. <laughs> <laughs> he's in Waka Wanda Blues, which is just another, again, 50s set movie just talking about blue collar urban towns playing the blues baby um and from that point on let's talk about yeah just even more short films and festival movies stuff i haven't even heard of but i would love to see and TV movies of the week, even Ron Clark's story for TNT he plays the principal. It's a whatever role. He does good. It's in an episode of Crossing Jordan as a colonel. Wouldn't be surprised if that's how he got the role in the similar set Boston show, Rizal and Owls, where he plays a Navy commander to, as well as a dad of one of the characters. So. <laughs> and then that episode of Stargate he shares with the guy who we'll be talking about, Michael Ironside, both in rare good guy roles. <laughs> Once again, plays a colonel patient on ER for a few seasons, then shows up in an anthology of Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror. So there you go. Which I have not seen. So he, say. Yeah, there you go. And then he's on Desperate Housewives. And I've never seen it, but he played a cop. And on Cold Case as well. Mm-hmm. Episode. Gotta do those guest spots, baby. Stars in the Keith Carradine star, All Star Cast Western All Hat. I, based on my five out of ten rating, I clearly didn't care for it. 
brief guest spots on Las Vegas. I don't recall it, but I'm sure it was funny. And on the miniseries Final Approach, just another hostage thriller. Plays the superior who, you know, demotes the <laughs> hero. <laughs> and then let's talk about playing Gus's di- first dad on site. There's many other dads that show oh, yeah. up. <laughs> it's the running joke. Get a famous <laughs> black actor to play Gus's dad. <laughs> yeah, that was so fun. First it's John. <laughs> yeah, then it's John Amos. Then it's freaking Keith David, who's a similar actor. Yeah. And you lose track. Um, now... But he probably had the best one out of all the guys because basically oh, he was being framed. He's like, what? I mean, I cut his bushes. I, I didn't even kill the guy. <laughs> and again, I, I would, wouldn't be surprised if he was trained by working with Adam West because basically he and Ironside can both do the whole just make everything funny, even if it's not funny. Like, just do it straight, but play mm-hmm. along with everybody. They just, they, you never get a sense that they're not in on the joke on whatever they do that's great uh so endless other movies and shows and brief oh that's right he plays one of the lawyers on bones briefly and yeah Yeah. a bunch of other indies and guest spots and playing cops again and generals best part his bald head is the best part of dragon ball evolution i forgot he was in that thing oh my god God. (laughs) More police captain roles. He was the best part about Smoking Aces too. Briefly shows up in the indie film Machete Joe as the sheriff. And again, like he, that movie was already way more decent than I compared to what its rating claimed. And uh, but he just elevated it. He was so on the actors' levels, even without making them feel unwelcome or unfit to be part of the movie. And it's like that's great for what probably took a day. You elevated the movie. And then plays Van Buren's boyfriend, Frank, on the last season of Law and Order. And that was great, too. That was. He just knows how to speak without even saying anything. He's, he's dynamite. Probably one of the best voiceover roles in the stupid sequel to another stupid Disney movie called Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Does plenty of other guest spots, Children's Hospital, Criminal Minds, White Collar, <laughs> mm-hmm. Torchwood. I met your monitor. He plays himself. I think I did see that episode. Um, I think I did as well. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it was a heavily promoted episode or something. I think so. <laughs> and back to, again, indies and TV movies and then mainstream guest spots. This dude is just immortal. It's immortal. Should have been a highlighter. Well, that would have been fascinating. To see. Are you listening? Mm-hmm. Are you listening, Hollywood? Then once again, voiceover guest role to Beverly Hills to all free. I didn't see that one. Starts a bunch of other indies. I hear the Western ambush at Dark Canyon, everyone should totally see, pretty well produced. Just shows you that people can be independent and actually do a good job making a movie. Then stars in I have never once again another horror anthology called Master for a Rod Jim. Never heard. Never heard of that. But he looks hysterical holding a knife on that cover. <laughs> <sighs> Never heard of it. Looks fun. If schlocky. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> could not be. Uh, then, just nonstop. Plays a judge on Guys with Kids. I recall that being a really bad Jimmy Fallon produced show, Anthony Anderson. But if you want to see it, I'm sure you can find it on Prime or Peacock. Um, then, on, once again, does a cartoon voiceover for Dan Versus. He was really good as, like, the Speaker of the House who was staging a coup in the show Last Resort. Where can you find that? Just stream. You can find it on Crackle. Easy, easy binge watch. <laughs> Wraps it up all perfectly. 13 episodes, you'll want more by the end. Um, and then, again, just trucking along, trucking along. Just start only abysmal movie on his entire resume, I gotta say, is Battle Dogs. <laughs> yeah, that I can tell just from the cover. Of- <laughs> it was bad. I saw it live. I didn't have a choice. I was like, this is a piece of wank. 
it's so funny seeing him in it because he and all the act- other actors at various points break character. <laughs> he just <laughs> guffaws at the screen. And he's like, he didn't care. Why would I? Um, and connection to a friend of the show, Ashley Judd. So he stars in her anthology, Call Me Crazy, a five film. Talking about anthology, about people inflicted with breast cancer. Then goes back to voice acting. We covered Transformers, everything. And he was part of Transformers Prime as he was the main, like, NSA, like, CIA agent. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, does a few other indies that star the likes of Robert Davi and Joe Estevez. And does TV specials and then shows up as one of the mob bosses on Mob City, which was a great TNT show. And once again, more Hallmark stuff, more guest spots on sitcoms and i really actually even though it came on lifetime this was a pretty and was mocked on the soup i actually found this a pretty stunning true crime movie called the grim sleeper where he and michael o'neill of the unit fame got to play detectives (laughs) going after a real life case and they just both just had it down to a t is like yeah this is great then stars in the Hillary Swank, Joshua Hamill drama, You're Not You, which I hear is good, but I have not seen. And then from that point on, just again, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's never gets old. Um, then uh, plays the judge on Franklin and Bash. I only really saw parts of that show. Um, plays a dad in a key and pill skit and then plays himself on Hot in yeah. Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Then plays King Poseidon on an episode of Once Upon a Time. And then stars in, again, just a TV One original movie to hell and back. Basically, it's a wonderful life. A guy has to question his faith and everything. Then does a Kevin Sorbo faith movie. And then does one episode, uh, and probably one of my favorite episodes of Robot Chicken, where he got to play not only himself, but like as a detective and as a judge and as a tech, <laughs> it just was an ultimate parody. And then <laughs> it's a hysterical episode because he's also playing against a lot of the other nerdy recurring characters as well as bitch pudding. And it's like, I'm reprimanding you bitch pudding. <laughs> <laughs> great, great shit. Great shit. And Plays Lucius Fox, you know, the character Morgan Freeman played in Batman Bad Blood, one of the animated movies. Plays a judge, again, in God's Not Dead 2. I only saw the trailer for that. I was dying. I was on the floor laughing. (laughs) All the talents wasting their time in that shit fest, and it was just so hysterical just seeing just again, just he he always has that voice down to it, too. No, you will not. (laughs) I'm Ernie Hudson. And speaking of which, I can't go a day without hearing that Thomas J. Henry car prevention ad. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> and it's a hysterical ad because he's literally in front of the Ghostbusters mobile. <laughs> it's, That's crazy. Cool. it's great. Oh, so you've seen that ad too. I, I've seen an ad, yep. <laughs> I kept hearing the radio version of it. I was like, oh. So then recurring role as neighbor Miles on Modern Family. I always light up each time he's on. I'm like, hey, he's already on. <laughs> I always enjoy when he shows up on me, you know? Mm-hmm. He's in every season. Good season, bad season. He's on the political satire Graves with Celia Ward and Nick I'm sure it's got to be funny. It looked funny. Much like Alpha House. Then plays the captain on APV. Saw some of that. I was very let down by it. Plays a colonel role once again on the recent season of Twin Peaks. Just like Ashley Judd. And uh, did you see any of Angie Trebekah? That was a Naked Gun kind of police academy kind of show. That was on TBS for a while. I actually did not see that one. So basically, newsflash, he plays a dad. Of course. <laughs> he plays her dad, Pete. And it was just so funny how they, they had a timeline. There's like, they keep hinting. It was one day I'm going to meet my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him how much I love him. And, she, he shows up and then he basically escapes. She's like, no, dad. You never want anything to do with me. And Ernie, again, he's just good at just playing with all just the spoofy 
role that it is and just <laughs> just like i love you i think i love you <laughs> um then after that just more guest spots more guest spots more voiceovers more voiceovers stuff i don't even recall them being on apparently on the cartoon show hot streets i saw part of it i don't remember it but it's decent for what it is guest spot on arrow voice acting in one of the nba games then recurring role is again uh one of the friends on grace and frankie um i do remember that role yeah it was a good role and recurring role on disney's puppy dog pals there you go <laughs> then okay. gabriel gabriel union's ex-cop dad on la's finest then he had a brief role in the movie Redemption Day, which I thought was pretty cool. Starred, but I don't recall him or Robert Never in it, so I will have to rewatch it. Hmm. It's a cool spy film. Not a must see, but cool. And then, here we go. Let's see his own episode of Guyver. Yeah, <laughs> the new one. <laughs> Surprised he wasn't on the old one. I guess they couldn't get him at the time. Get him. He's played the president in a bunch of B movies. He should play the president, you know, in a big mainstream movie. I guarantee you, everyone will watch it. He can hide his age pretty well. I really am surprised. I, if you had to give me a guess of how old he is, I wouldn't know. Probably 70, maybe almost 80. He's just good at hiding it. He's just always had the gray hair. Dark gray hair. Yeah. And it was son acted for a while, junior. And then, yeah, he appeared, reprised his role on... Ghostbusters Afterlife. What can I say? He's really good on the family business. I haven't seen it all the way through. It just seems to be another just gangster show that varies by quality. But hey, it's going on in three seasons now. So someone's watching it. Um, Somebody is. <laughs> and he's going to be in the upcoming season of City on a Hill. So cannot wait. I see he also has his really called the retirement plan with him, Nicholas Cage, and Ron Coleman. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds like a fun heist movie. So his character's name on City on a Hill is Ward. That would mean he's real... He, I'll give you a hint. He's probably a father of Aldous Hodge's character because Aldous Hodge's character is ADA Ward. Let's do the... Let's connect the dots here, people. Why wouldn't he play a dad? Exactly. And so, yeah, he's got a bunch of other projects. John Carl Bugler movie. I thought he died. I guess it's one that they haven't finished. Didn't he work on Leviathan with him? I think he did. There you I'm go. There's a connection. Well, so why is Ernie basically exempt from any criticism whatsoever? <laughs> because he hasn't phoned in the performance. That's what I've always said about him. Ever. Even if he's in a bad film, he manages to save it i would say at the time he's just as best part about any movie because he really just focuses on i think just the truth just tell the truth on screen what does the character say i didn't know he was a reserve deputy sheriff for actually in the san bernardino office for 14 years so that's pretty awesome mm. <laughs> so listed in the marine corps but Medically discharged due to asthma. Damn, okay. But yeah, trained at Yale University, so the best of the best. It's a bunch of giant family. Yeah. Yeah. All that it works. He almost was in that awful 96 Doctor Who movie, but Eric Roberts won the role. That's okay. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend being on that. Hosted Cinemax's Summer of a Thousand Movies. That's hysterical. <laughs> it's been something that happened in the 90s or something. <laughs> it must have. So, what do you think you remember him for the most outside of Ghostbusters? Pause. Well, I always remember him not only from The Crow, but also his role was in Congo and as I said, for Leviathan, it's one I always. Yeah, he's he's starting just so many movies of different kinds, and yet he's you just really 
get a sense that he he could carry the movie even by himself regardless of whether he's in charge or not I just don't ever feel like there's going to be a time where he can not be fully active like I, I never get a sense that he doesn't like acting I've never heard any fucked up thing about him bitch slapping someone or refusing to do what the director asks and I think everyone just loves him so much they'd leave him alone I bet <laughs> mm-hmm. he never does any shortage of doing conventions he's like yep I'll talk about Ghostbusters for the billionth time I love it <laughs> and occasionally he'll get questions about the other films hopefully <laughs> yeah I hope so just saying yeah ask him more guys ask him more ask him about Congo no escape Horizon whatever come on now yeah any blockbuster movie. Anything. So, thank you for being on here once more. And let's go ahead and talk. Anytime. <laughs> we'll return after these messages. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like Robocop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S. We are in the U.K. We are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan. We're in Australia, y'all. Blindknowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked-